Well, Peter, welcome. Thanks, David. We're uh, here to talk a bit about Transfield and your involvement with the, the company, and it's a it's an unusual one in that uh, the uh, the Perisher investment was a bit outside the the normal Transfield interests, but I'm sure as we talk about it, we'll see how all those pieces come together. But you've you've been down there involved with uh, the company from a very early age. Why don't you tell us a bit about how you got involved with, with Perisher? Yeah, well, uh, that's that's true, David. Um, I grew up in, in Perisher and uh, Dad uh, is Swiss and he moved to the area um, in the 1960s and started the first a la carte restaurant in Perisher Valley and uh, subsequently went on to uh, cater to uh, many of Transfield's developments in the area, actually. But um, yeah, mum and dad ran hotels in Perisher for 30 years, and uh, I grew up amongst all of that. So uh, growing up in hospitality and uh, skiing every spare second that I could, um, I think a logical career progression for me was to try and stay in the industry and uh, having the hospitality and business background from, from the family certainly helped with that. And uh, continue to do that now with my kids. So yeah. uh, we, we really yeah. enjoy the uh, the environment and uh, the challenges of operating the winter business. Yeah. Where, where did you go to school? I went to school in Jindabyne and then uh, for high school went away to Canberra Grammar as a boarder for, for right. six years. Yeah. And then you went on to university and did a law degree? Yeah, did uh, commerce and law and uh, intertwined with all of that, stayed involved with the business uh, on the competitive side of uh, skiing, managing events and ski racing and that sort of thing as a sort of holiday job. And uh, yeah, managed to stay in touch with the business and uh, that did me well over time. It has and it's quite both remarkable and, and unusual to, uh, to uh, grow up in that environment and yet still be able to uh, get all that education and experience and then blend the two together. It's uh, not, not all that common. No, it's not. And you know, there's certainly not, uh, there's not many ski resorts in Australia, so there's obviously not <laughs> many uh, leadership positions in those. So, yeah, it's uh, been very, very fortunate to be able to continue in the, in the business, if you like, that mum and dad were in so long ago. So when your father, mother and father came out here, that was after the Snowy Mountain scheme had been well advanced, or was that still under, uh, under construction at that time? It was in the completion days, the very completion days of that. Um, and Dad's, you know, Dad's restaurants were really, really focused on those key years of growth in, of skiing in, in Parishes Smiggins. Um, obviously, well before uh, Ski Tube and, and Blue Cow, those days. And uh, they were uh, looking at the photos. They were good times in those days. <laughs> yeah, I, I always thought this could be wrong, but I always thought that a lot of the development of the ski fields in Australia was due to the fact that so many European uh, people came out here for the Snowy Mountain Scheme and stayed and developed an interest. But uh, I mean, there, there was obviously skiing down there well before that, but it always seemed to have a European flavour. Is that a fair assessment? Yeah, certainly, certainly. Yeah. I think. You know, places like Guthiga, um, you know, they were they were developed by the Norwe Guthiga was developed by the Norwegians, and has that style about it. Um, and certainly, you know, families like the Belgiorno Nettises got involved in lift tower construction um, because they had expertise in uh, transmission towers. So we see that in the Mount Perisher double. Um, <laughs> and uh, then the ski yes, schools. It looks like it ought to have. Uh transmission <laughs> well it does it's yeah. it's uh, it's it's the same sort of lattice work construction yeah. mm. and uh, obviously with uh, with specialized ski lift componentry on it yeah. but um, I think the the passion of those families for skiing saw them in you know the Australian Alps at that time and uh, 
we also imported then all of our ski instructors from, from Austria. And so all the ski schools in Australia, including Perisher, had a, a real bent um, towards you know, Austria. Mm. And uh, the, the place at the time you know, had a real European culture. And then, of course, many of those ski instructors settled in the area. And uh, I went to school with many of their kids. Um, and that, that, that tradition lives on. And you were saying your father catered for some of the Transfield workforce that were down there over the years? He did actually. He, he ran a restaurant in the Perisher Centre called Kurtz and uh, during the construction years of Ski Tube in so 85 through 87, 88, um, he opened in summer as well as winter and catered to the construction workers. So I can remember, because I used to help him in the kitchen, um, you know, have extremely busy lunches with uh, all the construction workers coming out of the tunnel. And uh, yeah, it was uh, good fun times. Lots of Italians working for Transfield at that time. Mm -hmm. And uh, I can remember uh, Dad attempting his Italian with, uh, <laughs> with some of those guys mm -hmm. and, uh, and having a great deal of fun. So yeah, he went on from there actually uh, to work for Transfield. Um, when they owned Blue Cow Guthiger in 1991 mm -hmm. and, uh, and he and Mum then worked uh, for Transfield and then Perisher Blue um, up until about 10 years ago. So yeah, the family's got a, a long history of working uh, also for, for the Transfield. Yeah, yeah. And the, the Transfield tradition in those remote construction sites, whenever I talk to the guys that have been involved, in them, they always talked about the food. There was always plenty of it, great variety, uh, and well, you know, high quality. And uh, I remember talking to uh, Franco about that, and he said that was uh, there were two tricks to getting uh, a productive workforce: feed them well and send them home safe. <laughs> and uh, we take that a lot more for granted today. But. Well, it's a hard thing to do in, in regional mm. areas is to give uh, workers a, a good lunch. And uh, I think that's, uh, that was why Dad was so, so successful in Perisher mm. in those years. Um, it worked very well. Hard to get a good lunch in Perisher in some of these days. <laughs> yeah, it's not, not the same. Do you remember much of the uh, ski tube construction? Yeah, I do actually. Yeah, and no, I remember... Um, Certainly the whole of the valley of Perisher being opened up and the creeks diverted and uh, the massive hole in the middle of the valley. Um, the tunnel boring machine um, coming in on, on trucks and uh, the construction, you know, it was the biggest construction project um, by far in the region. So mm. for, everyone was involved and uh, the amount of heavy machinery and that sort of thing coming through town, the employment it was, uh, it was a real boom time for the area, mm. you know, in the summer seasons, which were traditionally mm. you know, pretty quiet. Yeah. And there were, it, it, it was a, a job that was not without some incidents. Do you remember the, uh, I think there was a, there was a rock fall at one stage and there was a fire at another stage. And Correct. And a, I think a chemical spill yeah. and a gas leak. Um, yeah, it was, yeah, it was interesting days. <laughs> there was always something going on. Yeah, yeah. And then uh, something I remember is the, the buses in the tunnel um, from yeah. Perisher up to Blue Cow. I can remember riding on the bumpy old buses before the, uh, the train was finished. Uh, but then, of course, you know, the excitement of having a new ski resort, you know, having Blue Cow open up with all new lifts and uh, fantastic views. Um, you know, right in the middle of the 80s when the ski industry was booming, it was, it was very exciting. Mm. Mm. And what were you doing when the, the amalgamation of the various resorts occurred in, that was 1995? 95, 95 yeah. yeah. Back then I was, uh, I think I was a couple of years into university and uh, working in race department and winter sports club coaching ski racing and uh, I think then I was uh, I was 20 so uh, I was having a good time in the ski resort <laughs> and, the, and the moguls were 
thrashing out how they could uh, combine all the, the resorts. Do you think that was a good good move? Oh, I think it was a fantastic move. Um, you know, it really did create such a magnificent ski resort. I think before that, the uh, the small ski resorts were um, really limited. They were true to their heritage in that they were created by those groups of uh, Europeans that came out and wanted to build a little resort so that mm. they could enjoy their favourite pastime. But merging them together, you know, really did result in a fantastic tourist offering and one now which, you know, is well integrated and uh, is the biggest resort in the Southern Hemisphere and uh, you know, got onto the radar of, of Vale Resorts as their first international acquisition. So I think just that indicates, you know, how successful a move it was. And so in that amalgamation or merger, the, uh, the Packer family owned a, a significant majority and uh, transfer of the the minority. What's your observation on, on how all that worked? Well, I wasn't really involved at the time, um, but I, I think the, the transfer ownership and development of Blue Cow and Ski Tube really brought much needed competition to the industry in the 80s. It was, I think the industry was a little bit lazy and the competition that Transfield introduced greatly improved the level of customer service and it made the industry more price competitive. So then the merger, I think, really benefited after that period in that it had lifted customer service in the Australian ski industry because of that competition. And, you know, post, post the merger, um, you know, I think it was certainly looking from the outside, um, but then later on, obviously, uh, working with you and others on the board, a really successful partnership. I think mm. CPH and Transfield brought different skills and qualities to the table. Both families, obviously, were involved for many, many decades before, mm. so had you know, good experience in the industry, different perspectives, but I think it led to you know, the, the, uh, the result of, you know, a, a real world-class ski resort. Mm. And that, of course, has been, uh, you know, being Australians, we never actually believed this stuff about ourselves until someone from overseas sort of <laughs> gives us the tick, and, and that's just happened with Vale, hasn't it? I think that's right. I think... You know, Australia is, you know, obviously challenged with, with snow. And I think Transfield and CPH understood that really well and made significant but sensible investments in snowmaking. And especially in the last 10, 15 years have insulated that weather risk to the business. But most importantly, it's resulted in a fantastic product for our guests. And uh, yes, we'd always like more snow, who doesn't? Um, and, and people are prepared to travel for that. And hence, I think Australians can sometimes put the Australian ski industry down. But you're right, David, you know, Vale um, are seen as being the world leader in operating alpine resorts. And for them to uh, look around the, res the world with a global expansion strategy and choose Perisher as their first investment, I think mm -hmm. it is you know, very good evidence that uh, we have a great resort, and uh, it's been run fairly well. Mm. Yeah, as we've we've talked, uh, there's a, a sense of sadness about the sale, but also a sense of great pride that, uh, as you just say, that Vale identified Perisher as their first international investment, and uh, so it's a, a lot of emotions in. Uh, in, in that, that period. Yeah, there is, and I think, you know, for Parrish's staff as well, you know, many, many of whom have worked for uh, the, the Packer and the Bell John O'Nettis families for you know, 30 years, 40 years. Um, we've actually got some ski instructors this year that are celebrating 50 years of, of work for mm. the resort, um, you know, which is just, it's amazing. Um, that you can be ski instructing for all those years to start with. Um, 
but there's a great great deal of loyalty to the families and um, and I think there should be a feeling of, of pride because you know it's not it's not easy by any stretch operating ski resorts to start with and I think operating them in Australia and national parks adds additional layers of complexity and uh, I think it's been done you know, very well over time. Yeah. What are the, what are some of the uh, standout memories of the time you've been working with with Perisher? The the decisions that, in hindsight, turned out to be really important. I think, yeah. You know, although it was in my early days of working for the resort, the merger um, was, I think, you know, really transformational of the resort. I was working on the blue cow side at the time, and uh, so too were my parents. So it was a nervous time, um, and thinking uh, what, what was going to happen. But interestingly, many or the majority of the senior management from the blue cow side actually ended up as being the senior management of Perisher Blue, mm -hmm. uh, with a lot of the management from uh, Perisher leaving. And I think that was testament to the team that Transfield had in place in Blue Cow at the time. Mm. And of course, many of those managers are still here. Mm. Um, mm. The likes of Ian Brandon as of, of CFO and mm. uh, Richard Tuck in mm. administration. You know, really strong managers that mm. have been committed to the place for a long time. So that was, that was transformational, the merger, and, uh, and very, very exciting. And since that time, um, some, of the, some of the developments, I think, David, would be uh, you know, the most exciting. I think the decision to take snowmaking up to the top of Mount mm. Perisher in 2006, you know, that was the biggest construction project that we'd undertaken in quite some time and uh, I think really changed the reliability of skiing in the resort and we're still benefiting from that now. Mm. Mm. Um, the village process was one that uh, you should probably should be uh, touched on, in that you know it, it did take up uh, a significant amount of uh, the board's time and management's time, and you know, to date hasn't resulted in, in any mm. development in in the resort. Yes, I've never worked out whether to think we were fortunate in it taking so long that we hadn't made a commitment prior to the GFC, and therefore didn't suffer the potential consequences of trying to sell sell things in a uh, very unfavourable environment or or if we had have actually pushed through at that time you know what might have happened but it uh, as you say it certainly it certainly took up a lot of time it was I think we all wanted to see it happen but it was just even internally, we couldn't sort of manipulate the numbers to make it make it really stack up. Yeah, so that that's certainly a, a highlight in terms of um, a body of work. I think it was you know a very interesting project, but um, I think uh, I think we actually ended up making better investments um, than the village. I think the investments in snow making and lifting um, in the long term will be far better for the business. Yeah. Now I've I've always been incredibly impressed with the Perisher management as you know and, and one of the examples I give is there's been a couple of very significant uh, IT computer based information technology changes and whether you've skillfully disguised what really happened or not, but it always appeared to the board that they came in on time and on budget, which uh, I've, I've never hadn't experienced that anywhere else. So you must be very pleased with, with, with those developments as well. Yeah, I think um, some of the big ones there would be the implementation of RFID ticketing and uh, the transition to a new resort-wide point-of-sale system. Um, yeah, really important developments that we're still benefiting from in terms of the ability to buy online 
and enabling customers to go direct to the lift. Mm. Um, and that's opened up opportunities with, you know, the, the thing that young people do all the yeah, time. Social now, the online, the social yeah, social media. Yeah, correct. It all uh, opened, opened that up. And, and the... Um, and the, the ticketing regimes that uh, you've been able to introduce. Yeah, I think it, it led to things like Freedom Pass. Mm. We were able to uh, come up with innovative pro projects and, and products and uh, ultimately they've been really successful. Mm. And I think you know, in terms of the budgeting and, and carrying those things out, they, they do come with uh, risk and, and hurdles. Mm. And, you know, we've had a few overruns here and there, but, um, yeah, I'd like to think that we've generally brought them in mm on time they've worked and uh, mm. to budget but we I mean we, we take that process pretty seriously and I think it's been a a learning from the board over many years where you know both companies have had rigorous capex processes and uh, y you have to deliver on those David I think if if you're not over time soon enough um, mm. the shareholders lose confidence to make investments in the business and we certainly wanted to uh, make sure that we could continue to invest yeah. wisely. So. Well, it's, it's certainly been a, um, uh, to, well, particularly to Guido and Luca, now they're still keeping their ties with the, with the resort in the, uh, in the hotel, the suite in the hotel there, and Guido was most adamant that had to be done, and. I didn't realise until you know we were talking about it that uh, he met Michelle, his wife, at uh, Perisher. I think I had heard that once yeah, before. So uh, yeah. that, uh, uh, that that gave some clear direction as to what needed to be achieved. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's a great yeah. thing that um, yeah. you know both families are maintaining their connection with the resort. And Guido and Luca, in particular, you know, they've got stories of riding horses up from the stables. Uh, I think back in the '60s, and uh, and skiing the resorts since they were kids. So, yeah. Yeah. the fact that they can continue to enjoy the resort with their kids and hopefully their kids is uh, fantastic. Yeah, no, it's, it's it's good. And what about you now? Part of a international, not quite conglomerate, but you know. Pretty sizable company. It is. Yeah, it's look, it's it's exciting. It's still only weeks into uh, the new ownership structure, but um, I think I've said before, David, if if anyone was going to buy Perisher, then uh, sort of VAR would have been mm. one of my picks. I think they've um, run a very good business for the last ten years, and as you know, many of the things that we've implemented in the last five. Um, have been inspired by some of the things that Vale's been doing, mm. obviously adapted for Australia. So how did it come about? Um, it was about uh, February 2014 where we were looking for the next steps for Freedom Pass, um, which as you know was our very successful Seasons Pass product that we introduced in 2012 which really lifted the performance of the resort. So we were, we were trying to think, how do we improve the value to our guests and how might we be able to partner with an overseas resort to give some skiing over there to benefit them? So I wrote to Rob Katz, the CEO, and suggested that we might be able to partner and uh, he came back and said, no, I don't think so, um, which was a bit disappointing. Uh, I was trying to think of plan B at that stage. And uh, shortly after, um, we had a conversation where he indicated that potentially Val might be interested to acquire the resort, which uh, came mm. as a little bit of a surprise. Mm. But um, one thing led to another, and a year later, a year and a bit later, the deal was done. Yeah, no, it was quite... Uh, it, it sort of seemed to come out of uh, from nowhere. And... Uh, uh, I, for one, felt that it was, you know, going to be one of those assets that you just kept forever. I wasn't unhappy about that idea either. <laughs> yeah, I think, you know, if you would have, if, if we would have discussed a year earlier that uh, it was likely that we would sell to Vale, I think it would have been dismissed um, 
by the board fairly quickly yeah. that it was an unlikely scenario and yeah. we had those conversations you know through the processes to what are the chances of this actually uh, happening yeah. and i think the um i think cph feel the same you know mm. it was an asset that they yeah. they certainly liked the family had an attachment to and uh was performing quite well so yeah yeah that's right well peter that's uh, a lot of lovely little anecdotes and stories there thank you very much for for coming in and it's been a tremendous pleasure working with you over the years and we've already agreed we'll stay in touch and uh, i look forward to that indeed david thank you yeah. it was uh, great to be part of the conversation and look forward to uh, staying in touch with you in the future